Good morning and good afternoon. On behalf of IUFRO and the coordinators of Working Parties 7.03.05 and 7.03.16, I would like to welcome you to this webinar in our webinar series on the behavioral and chemical ecology of bark and wood boring insects. For those of you who are new to IUFRO, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, this is a global, nonprofit, non-governmental science organization. This global, global organization includes approximately 15,000 members from 120 countries and 600 member organizations. IUFRO is made up of several divisions, and the working parties responsible for this webinar series reside within Division 7, Forest Health. The coordinator of Division 7 is Eki Brockerhoff, and within the division there are two research groups, Pathology, coordinated by Todd Ramsfield, and Entomology, coordinated by Marta Klepwick. These research groups are made up of working parties, and the working parties that host this webinar series, as mentioned, are 7.03.05, the Ecology and Management of Bark and Wood Boring Insects, and 7.03.16, Behavioral and Chemical Ecology of Forest Insects. The mission of IUFRO is essentially the same as that of these working parties in this webinar series, to advance research excellence and knowledge sharing and foster science-based solutions to forest-related challenges. One of the many things the current pandemic has made clear to me is that our most meaningful resource is our networks. <clears throat> For those of you who would like to learn more about IUFRO and how to become involved in this powerful research network, I encourage you to consider one or more of the options listed here. Before we get started, a little housekeeping. Josephine Kefalek, a senior PhD student at the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnology Institute at the University of Pretoria, will moderate this question period. For those of you who would like to ask a question, you can do it one of two ways. You can either use the raise hand feature in the chat box in which case at the appropriate time, Josephine will unmute your microphone and allow you to ask your question directly of the speaker. Alternatively, you can type the question into the chat box, and post it for everyone to see, and at the appropriate time, Josephine will ask your question for you. To make Josephine's job a little easier, I ask that you only post questions to everyone in the chat box, and if you have personal communication you'd like to do, please do that privately. I also remind you that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted after on the Working Party YouTube channel listed here. Before we get started, special thanks need to go out to a lot of people, most notably to Quentin Wignard, who is a senior PhD student also at the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnology Institute at the University of Pretoria, who manages the IT side of the webinar series, and as mentioned previously, Josephine Kefalek, who will moderate the webinar series and to the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnology Institute at the University of Pretoria, or FABI, as many of you likely know it, for providing the platform from which we provide the webinar series. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's symposium coordinator, Dr. Ring Carday. Ring is a distinguished professor of entomology in the Boyce Chair at the University of California, Riverside. Ring is well known for his contributions to the disciplines of chemical ecology and insect behavior, but undoubtedly he would say that his most significant contributions to science are the students and postdocs that he has trained and contributed to, the, to their respective disciplines. This may seem a bit tongue-in-cheek to those of you who know that I am one of those former students, but in all seriousness, among the compliments that we could give to Ring, the time we could spend discussing former awards won, etc., the one that stands out for me is that you can find his former students and postdocs. The majority are active in their scientific fields, which undoubtedly speaks to the mentorship that he's provided. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today's topic is pheromone dispersion and how we might understand what cues that provides for insect orientation to a pheromone source then ultimately how we might use some of that information in trapping to determine the distribution of invasive species, um, maybe to guide their eradication, and just in general to keep track of, of populations. Now, what I'd like to do in the introduction is describe the fine scale structure of odor plumes, 
and then establish how flying insects uh, actually manage to find the source, which gets to the principles of something we call optimotor or nemataxis. Uh, mostly I'm going to concentrate on moths because that's what I've worked on and there's some, of course, wonderful forest pests that are moths. In general, there are very many species of Lepidoptera, perhaps 150,000 described, and the majority of these have a female admitted pheromone uh, that's administered usually in pretty minuscule quantities and as it's carried downwind. Um, and so they're sometimes difficult to identify, but given the current technology, there are known attractants uh, and, and pheromones where we've actually been very, very certain of the structure where literally more than a thousand species, probably around 2,000 at this point. Now, this system is, is held to be a very, very sensitive olfactory detection system, maybe the most sensitive kind of system you could imagine because we think that one molecule can activate the receptor on a sensillum and fire it off and send a message to the brain. And probably about 200 firings uh, get above the background that is the firing rate of receptors that fire uh, spontaneously. And perhaps that's enough to cause upwind orientation. So if you look at some moths, such as the gypsy moth, which I'll spend some time on, you, you probably have tens of thousands, probably 80 or so thousand individual sensilla. So this ought to be an extremely uh, sensitive system, but we will actually establish that there are really constraints about how far a female can advertise her presence. And so here you see a female uh, on a tree trunk, uh, in this case, this is a European strain of the gypsy moth. This is a flightless female. She emerges on the trunk, calls from there, and lures a male in. Now, the plume itself uh, is actually quite discontinuous. Some of the early work that one sees depicts these plumes as a semi-ellipsoid, imagining that they're a fairly homogeneous cloud. That, that work was done years ago in the 40s, after World War II, where they were kind of interested in the notion of uh, plume structure from the viewpoint of uh, uh, gases that were used to, to kill humans. And so some of that is empirically measured and it's not really uh, uh, a theoretical construct in any meaningful sense. Here you see uh, a little source of titanium tetrachloride, which combined with moisture produces a, a visible plume. And the source is uh, probably about an inch and a half in diameter. And as you can see, as it's carried down when it turns into these little wisps of odor, some of which are fairly concentrated. And these filaments can persist for a very long time downwind. And this is what we call the active space. Now, it's, it's commonly assumed by, by some, logically, I suppose, that molecular diffusion plays an important role in plume uh, dispersal. But in fact, the rate of molecular uh, diffusion is extremely small. So we're really talking about not being able to imagine that within one of these filaments that uh, odors would disperse out of them, which means that the filaments themselves can be carried downwind and remain uh, essentially at a very high rate. But also within the filament, the ratio of compounds is not going to change in any meaningful sense. So the ratio at the source is, in fact, the ratio that the insect is detecting, even if it's tens of meters downwind. Now, the size of the plume I just showed you, maybe about uh, a couple of centimeters uh, initially, uh, is typical and in this way many people try to figure out distance of communication by using downwind um, measures of uh, odor and perhaps behavioral response. But many insects, in fact, call from foliage, and in the case of the gypsy moth here, the female calls from a tree trunk. And the initial size of that plume is, in fact, the width of that tree trunk. And if the plume passes through foliage, it's kind of torn apart. And that, in turn, means that it is not uh, a very uh, discrete. It's more diffuse, and therefore the concentration is lower. And it's very much harder, perhaps, to uh, find the source at a distance. But of course, because it's a wider plume, it may be easier to navigate. Now, the whole behaviors that mediate this are pretty well worked out about 50, talked about 50 years ago by J.S. Kennedy, but he really worked it out in about 1940. Uh, and he really uh, did not like the term attractant because 
It conveys the idea that the substances convey the, indicate where the plume is. That somehow uh, insects are following a concentration gradient, and uh, that is not in fact the case. He worked on this with the mosquito Aedes aegypti, and he did it with a little wind tunnel that enabled him to blow his carbon dioxide containing breath into the tunnel. And what he showed is that if you project a floor pattern on the tunnel, that it, and you move it back and forth, that the insect, in fact, uh, reacts to that wind tunnel floor pattern and not to the movement of air. So you can see from those experiments, which are well detailed and, and talked about in a lot of recent papers, that it is the optimotor nematactic response that dictates the insect being able to fly upwind. Now, <clears throat> this study uh, <clears throat> means that uh, heading upwind, you actually have a flow of the visual field that is front to rear. If you're not heading directly upwind, you have what we call transverse image flow, which means that it's side slip, and that indicates that you're not heading directly upwind. And as I mentioned, there's no need for information on odor concentration. Uh, chemotaxis, as it's sometimes called, because all you need to do is smell the odor and fly upwind. Now, that's not to say that there are not going to be problems because of fragmentation of the plume and some other issues I'll talk about a little bit later. And if you actually look at one of these flight tracks in the wind tunnel, or if you have a very good system in the field, what you can see is if the wind is coming from top to bottom and the insect is aimed off of the wind line, that in fact the uh, actual track that the insect follows is pushed by the wind speed. And so the insect in this case is not getting an absolute front to rear image flow, but he's getting this, this side slip here, this transverse image flow, because as he's moving along the plume, in fact, he's being pushed this way. So this is worked out by a paper by Marsh and Kennedy and, and the colleagues in 1978. And it really just builds on what he did with Aedes aegypti in 1940. Now, if we look at an insect such as a moth and, and perhaps a beetle flying upwind, we're going to see several different kinds of behaviors that I will talk about. But one of the most important is ranging flight. Ranging flight is the idea that uh, much of the time an insect is flying, it is in fact not in contact with pheromone. It's, uh, if you will, intent is to locate a pheromone plume. Uh, so in un interpreting behavior and behavioral response to pheromone traps, we have to be extremely concerned about the nature of ranging, ranging flight. Uh, what kind of tactic does the insect use? How fast is he going? Uh, is he stopping a lot? Is he turning a lot? He's certainly not flying in a straight line for a very long period of time. Uh, when it enters the plume, it enters and it goes through the zigzag flight. Uh, this is somewhat dictated by reiterative concentration, uh, contact with concentration changes. We call this counter-turning. Another issue that uh, is of extreme importance is that because of foliage, because of changes in wind direction, an insect can be flying directly upwind but exit the plume. Now then it has a need of a strategy to recontact the pheromone plume. We call this casting, and it's usually not much progress up or downwind, but side to side movement, and then in fact re-entering the plume. And while uh, at the end, it's often a, a straight upwind surge, and this is because the filaments of pheromone are being contacted at a higher rate, perhaps 10 hertz or more. Now I'm gonna leave you with one last uh, slide here. I'll come back to both of these, but it really concerns the notion of that plume structure. Now here you see a, a fairly typical trap for use with moths. It's called a Sectar 1C. And in a really nice paper that Lewis and Colley published in 1974, they looked at a lot of different kinds of traps and their efficacy in actually trapping a moth, in this case a, a pea moth, a very close relative of the cowling moth, into the trap and actually how well the trap actually lured the animal. In both cases here you see there's a source and sign of pheromone it's both emitting at the same rate. Uh, the trap is turned 90 degrees. It produces an entirely different kind of plume. The one at the top is much better for the insect to fly along that plume and get trapped than the one at the bottom. So with that, I will end and move uh, to my colleagues um, and, and let Josephine introduce them. 
But what we will be talking about eventually is the use of pheromone traps in surveillance uh, once we understand a little bit more about the plume's structure and uh, how we should uh, interpret behavior. Thank you. Hi, Rin. Uh, thank you very much for introducing today's themes. Um, so in the audience, if anyone has questions for Ring, uh, you're welcome to post them in the chat box or to raise your hand. Uh, just um, if, since at the end we will have multiple speakers, please indicate for whom uh, that question will be so I don't ask the question to the wrong person. Um, uh, that said, uh, let me introduce the next speaker. Uh, so our first uh, speaker is uh, Harold Thurstall. Um, so he's a recently retired uh, program manager of, of the Forest Health Protection Program at the Missoula Technology Devel Development Center, which is part of the Forest Health Technology Enterprise team. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, he's not going to join us for the discussion period, but you're welcome to uh, email him with questions. Okay, uh, so Quentin, you can lay his talk now. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Harold Thistle, and I've been asked to talk today a little bit about um, small gaseous plumes in, in plant canopies. And the, the approach uh, we've taken here, my background is in micrometeorology, and we try to provide some concepts and maybe some tools for folks working on this problem that'll give them some insight into, into what's going on. I have to move very quickly here today, but I wanted to tell one quick anecdote. Uh, way back, uh, I was working on my dissertation was on turbulence, high frequency measurement of flow in plant canopies. And I was in the ag school there at the University of Connecticut. And um, I had to go over to the mechanical engineering to take courses. And there was one course, homogeneous turbulence, which is the easiest treatment of turbulence. But if you, if you walked into this course from the hallway, you would have thought it was an advanced mathematics course. And I was really struggling. And there was one textbook that was used in that course, G.K. Batchelor. It was called Homogeneous Turbulence. It was published in 1953. And I really appreciated this little book. I thought it was elegant. He tried to explain the physical phenomena and, and relate the mathematics to it. Um, and so uh, he was a couple of research generations ahead of me, G.K. Batchelor. And so I never met him, but I had a colleague back there in the 1980s that had seen him talk recently then. And uh, I asked him, so what's he thinking about turbulence these days? And he said, well, he stopped studying turbulence. He said it was too confusing. And so that was kind of disheartening then. But I think, you know, where it leaves us, though, is that you can really, if you work in this area, you can find your own peace, your own place and understanding it. And the data that you collect is just des is describing it. So don't, you know, you can take heart in the fact that uh, even the people that wrote the books are confused. Okay, so we're going to quickly do some fluid dynamics concepts, very simple, a description of canopy meteorology. We're going to do some, I'm going to sort of point this all towards ideas around plume modification by traps. This, this allows me, going there allows me to point out some of the tools available and some of the physical phenomena. And I also wanted to make sure I listed, this is, a, this is composed of slides from many different slideshows over the years, so these are various people that have contributed to this. So this is a hard problem, a uh, fundamentally hard problem. Uh, the mathematics dictate that you can't explicitly solve it. So you can't, you can't say that I have a small plume, a one gram per second being eluded at time one. And so what's the concentration uh, in grams per cubic meter at time 10 seconds downwind? You can't, you can't do it exactly. Uh, it's not that I can't do it or you can't do it. Nobody can do it. But and also in canopies, it's almost impossible, and this is preaching to acquire, to know the position character of all the drag elements that you would need to exactly describe this flow. And we're always faced with this kind of averaging, aggregating these things. I think that uh, the folks on this, on this, um, on the Zoom meeting know this. And also the thermal input into the canopy is variable in time and space. Of course, there's diurnal variation, but also depending on the density of the, of the canopy, you know, out west, you could be in a, one of those parklands where you eat your lunch in the full sun. In the southeast, you're basically in a dark jungle. And so the distribution of solar radiation in those canopies affects the, the, the um, thermal state and the flows.
But fortunately, there's been an awful lot of work done with turbulence because that's what fluids do in, in many situations, especially in the environment. And so we've got in the atmosphere. So we've got a um, we had a, made a lot of headway with computers and approximately solving these equations and the computers can parse these things so finely and control the error that you've got very close to exact solutions. Now still, because of our problems with all these drag services and the distribution of the elements and knowing everything we need to know in a canopy, we, we aren't really there, but there have been a lot of people that have been challenged by this, um, the problem of canopy flow over the years and it's attracted some really good fluid dynamicists and so we have a good con conceptual understanding of these flows now and also tools to work with. So now let's quickly do Taylor's hypothesis. So my wife and I recently bought a retirement property in upstate New York and if you ask me where it was I might say it was an hour west of Elmira, New York. So what did I do there? You asked me for a location and I gave you a time Okay, so in velocity has time in it, right? Meters, meters per second. And Taylor's hypothesis says that if we take a, if we take a measurement at a point, the um, measurement that we get, which will be this in a, in a canopy in turbulence, it'll be this fluctuating measurement of velocity. It reflects what was happening upwind um, before the measurement was made. So it's called the frozen turbulence hypothesis. That if you measure at a point what you're getting is translation of these eddies past the point, so you're, you're reflecting uh, what's going on um, upwind in space. So you make a point measurement and you're implying what's happening uh, in space upwind over the time of the measurement. So this is actually sounds very simple, but it's actually quite a profound idea. And uh, we've been able in the modern, modern treatment of turbines been able to go a long way with this. Now let's look at this. This is a, uh, a trace of SF6. Uh, um, it's an amazing gas. You can put out at tiny amounts because you can find it at parts per trillion. And this was 20 years ago. We could measure it at one hertz at parts per trillion. So um, the observed trace uh, is the green trace. So what I think this represents, this is a, a small plume, and I think we were about 10 meters from the source of SF6 in a canopy, a large pole pine um, stand. And you can see that those peaks I believe here are a meandering plume crossing back and forth across the sensor because this was taken 10 meters from the source in, in fairly low velocity conditions. Now, as you go away from the sources, the plume, those meandering plumes may very well tear up into shards of, of gas. And so, so it's not necessary that these would be meanders. They might actually be little packets of gas moving past the sensor at a time, but I think here we're looking at the meandering plume passing back and forth across the sensor, yielding those peaks. And so the plume is driven by external scales, right? You have a small plume and the turbulence that is flowing it is a continuum of scales, a continuum of eddies of different sizes, okay? And so the, the larger eddies are the external scales and they grab the plume and they move the plume around. The plume spread, the width of the plume is controlled by internal scales. So these are the smaller size eddies that are internal to the plume and are causing it to spread. Now, the, I'm sure on this kind of call, there are various good chemists on the call. And generally, we think that molecular diffusion, we sort of state as an approximation, uh, is generally thought of as around 1% of mechanical diffusion. And we'll come back to that idea. Okay, now in, we'll look at Struhal analysis. So Struhal analysis says that the eddy shedding frequency around an obstacle is then the velocity of the flow divided by the some characteristic length of the obstacle. Okay, and so we'll we'll say more we'll say more about that. We also want to touch on Nyquist frequency. So now we've said that turbulence in these canopies, and all these different scales that we can conceptualize as these eddies rolling across us of this continuum of sizes. So how do we measure what's, what's happening in that flow? Well, if we just stick up an anemometer, right, we get something that looks like white noise, but it's actually not white noise, it's red noise. And so to look at a, a talk about the sampling of it, if we look at these kind of regular motions, so let's look at the sinusoid on the 
left. If we want to sample that, whatever quantity is represented by the red line, if we just sampled at where it, we, we set up our sampler and we didn't know what the signal looked like and we sampled and we just happened to sample at the points of the crossings of the horizontal line, we would infer that we had a, a if we'd had no variation. Okay, we had a DC signal, so to speak. If we set up and we happen to sample at where the vertical lines happen to hit the, the signal, then we might do okay. Then we, if we connected the dots between the top point and the bottom, we'd come up with kind of a triangular wave and we'd be pretty close. So the Nyquist frequency says that if you know phasing, you can, you can adequately recreate this signal with two samples a cycle. Now we never know, we never know phasing in the environment. So we're talking about turbulence. We've got these eddies going by and we're trying to figure out what they are. We have no, no information about phasing. Actually, they're not really periodic typically. We're looking at a density of variance that can be associated with the uh, uh, various um, frequencies and wavelengths. So if you measure this wrong, okay, so you've got this high frequency wave here on the right and you, you those black dots represent your measurement, you infer you've got a low frequency signal. And what this is called is aliasing because of incorrect sampling frequency. And when you look at the whole spectrum and you try to figure out where your energy is in these all this continuum of wavelengths, and we'll look at that in a minute, what you do is you fold, incorrectly fold their high frequency energy into your low frequency energy and you um, reach the wrong conclusions. To get the correct variation, you need to sample at 10 samples per cycle. Now, since you have this continuum of, of eddies in the atmosphere, we're never sampling high enough to get them all. So we just have to be aware that this would be where we, the ones we sample at 10 would be the ones we're sampling adequately or lower frequency, you know, because we have more samples per cycle, but the higher frequency ones, we're going to roll into our low frequency. This is called aliasing and you fold that energy incorrectly and to the uh, to the lower wavelength. So eddy shedding from traps, and I'll try to tie all this together as we go. But let's just talk about then eddy shedding from traps. So if the trap characteristic length is 20 centimeters and airflow is one meter per second, then we would the shedding frequency would be five hertz. But but that would imply that the measurement to get this required would be at 50 hertz. So this is really even though it's technologically possible, this this is not really necessary or something we want to do. And the, the hard part of this is really that the characteristic length then is hard to know because it depends on the approach angle. And the hard part is that we're existing again in this continuum of eddies of all different shapes and sizes. So it's very hard to know the approach angle because you've got all these things swirling past. And on the left here then is what we call a power spectra of turbulence. So the vertical axis is energy and the horizontal axis is frequency. And so we've taken our very noisy signal and we've decomposed it into um, sinusoids and we've integrated them and we see where the variance really is at what frequencies the variance is. And so we see towards the left side of that axis, we've got our production and that's the longest, um, the longest wavelength you're gonna run into in a canopy. And that's created by the boundary layer. The little graph, the little diagram here on the right shows that the higher, faster moving air at height, um, the slower moving air near the ground, um, that's slower because of drag on the surface, that starts to create a roller as the fat, we call the flow tripped, the faster moving air trips and starts to roll. Um, and so that that's your production length. And then we go all the way down um, to dissipation which, is, which are very small scales where the viscosity of the air takes the, uh, damps out the eddies. And so in between there, the eddies basically tear themselves apart. And this is without a canopy. And they, the turbulence spectra always shows this slope. It's a physical property of the flow based on the um, viscosity of the flow. So it's really interesting. That can actually be used to troubleshoot. But the point is you've got these long, higher energy scales that push air into your canopy, and then you go all the way down to dissipation. And so dissipation in the atmosphere is on the order a little bit below uh, one centimeter, single millimeters. So dissipation may be important to the discussion today
because some of our small insect sources may actually then put out in a may actually elute into a flow <coughs> that it has no internal scales and moves then with just the external scales initially before molecular diffusion widens it out. Okay, and the other thing that, that canopy does very effectively is takes all the kinetic energy out of flows, amazingly effective absorbers of kinetic energy. And that's why if you ever worked in canopies, you, so you have typically at the surface of the earth, we have this sort of ideally or theoretically, we call it a no-slip boundary. But in canopies, in the canopy, near the base of the canopy, you're typically in very low flow regimes, which allow plumes to stay together. And so then this is a just a diagram. We measure the turbulent kinetic energy and T4 is, uh, we, we thinned um, the canopy here, working with Brian Strom down in Loblolly Pine. And uh, T1 is unthinned, T4 is four thinnings later. And you can see that the um, thicker, denser stands just suck the kinetic energy out of the flow. And so resulting in lower velocities and, and less energetic turbulence. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. I'm here for questions. Welcome back. What I'm now going to talk about is the use of pheromone traps in surveillance on base of moths, effects of uh, ranging flight, distance of attraction, and the effect of efficiency of traps and actually capturing males that are lured to the vicinity of a trap. Some of these applications are pretty extensive, and um, because we're using a gypsy moth as a model, I should tell you that uh, there are usually a couple hundred thousand traps placed out every year for detection of. Uh, the Asian gypsy moth, which is an invasive animal which is not established in the United States, and also to uh, understand the uh, movement and possible uh, containment of uh, gypsy moths in the eastern part of the United States. So it does have a lot of application. Remember we talked about the components of uh, source location, and I'll spend a little time on ranging flight, uh, a little bit on flight along the plume. I will point out that sometimes males exit the plume because of changes in wind direction. They engage in casting behavior, which we really don't have time to talk about, but it's a fascinating way to recontact the plume. And then up close to the source, often the male speeds up and goes with what we call an upwind surge. Now, ranging flight is really critical to understanding uh, the whole process of uh, source location because you have to find a bloom. Uh, females, uh, for example, are maybe mated very quickly. Uh, traps are available all the time, but you may not be very near a trap if you're a male, and so you have to have a strategy for locating it. Now, there are various models that sort of talk about what if you went upwind or downwind or crosswind and how would these actually facilitate it, but when we actually look at field data, we find that uh, in the case of a gypsy moth, which is a day-flying moth without moth parts, therefore its only flight behavior is to find a female, uh, that there are no uh, sort of strategies to pick a wind direction. It's just random with respect to contemporaneous wind direction. However, we can point out that because upwind and downwind comprise two different directions, and there are two crosswind directions that, in fact, a sort of de facto preference is for crosswind. And one can imagine that's useful if the plume is stretched out linearly because crosswind, you're more apt to contact it. So this is a very uh, difficult area to sort of document. Um, and there are technologies that are being developed that might help us there. But the whole notion of how plume finding uh, occurs is a difficult one to investigate. Here's another species we looked at. Gives you an idea of how you can analyze these tracks. Uh, these were video records in the field. And what one sees is that there's a distribution which is essentially even with respect to all 360 degrees. It really doesn't matter which way the wind is blowing. A uh, little arrow means that there's no statistical significance. So we think that in general, this is the, the behavior that moths have. Now, how far away can a male actually detect a female or lure? That's, a, that's an interesting and somewhat a difficult question to answer. Uh, here's how we look at it. Uh, in the field, we set up a system wherein we had a, a tree surrogate, which was emitting pheromone, 
And then at distances up to 120 meters, we had racks of males, uh, which we could monitor and release. Uh, the most difficult part of setting this experiment up was knowing which way the wind would be blowing, be blowing over the next couple of hours. And sometimes we had to wait a while before the wind shifted to exactly where we wanted it to be. Here's how we set it up. Uh, on the right, you see an observer with a tape recorder telling us when males are wing fanning. As soon as they start wing fanning, they are released and they can proceed upwind. <coughs> and on the left, we have a, uh, another colleague with a butterfly net who captures these males as they come into the, to the pheromone lure. So we know for all of those males that we release, uh, how many uh, are coming from a particular distance and how long it takes them. So we can put together a pretty uh, elaborate system here of understanding distance of communication Close by at 20 meters, um, most all males depart, and about half of them, only half of them, arrive at the source. And those that do uh, have a median transmit, transit time of about four minutes, they should be there much, much more quickly if they were flying directly. Or maybe even less than 1.7 minutes. They should get there very quickly based on their flight velocity. If you look all the way out to 120 meters, then you find that, yes, a fairly large proportion of those males actually detect the pheromone, but only 8% of those actually arrive. And they take a very long time to get there again. Had they been flying directly along the plume, uh, they should have arrived much more quickly. So, you know, there's something going on here, and uh, it could be turbulence. It's not understory because, as you've noticed in those forests, uh, there, there is no understory. So uh, Joe and I got at this by uh, using two strategies, uh, a neutrally buoyant balloon or a puff of smoke that was released in the forest and then could be followed uh, and uh, with a very high-tech system of little bamboo stakes and, and labels, we could mark where the plume was at a given point in time and then actually show what its trajectory was. And as you see here in the lower left panel, that particular trajectory was pretty straight and clearly a moth that entered that sort of a plume probably could have followed it to its source very quickly. But if you look over to the right, you can see others that are, uh, I'm afraid, more typical where the wind changes direction, and in fact the plume bends around and, and it's exceedingly difficult to follow. So th this is the conundrum that a male moth faces, that wind is changing direction frequently and is, is really, really difficult to follow. We can depict this in another way, which is a series of puffs. Uh, the ideal situation for a male would be panel A, where the puff is somewhat enlarged over time because of the uh, diffusion, but in fact, the direction toward the source is always the direction upwind. Uh, B is a sort of a representation of what, frankly, many of us thought in the 70s might be the way plumes work, but in fact, if a plume is snaking, as you see in C, it's because each of those puffs is moving in a straight line. That's at a constant wind speed. If the wind picks up, it gets even more difficult for a male because the wind uh, <coughs> vectors get bent around. So you can see why over long distances, it's very difficult to follow one of these plumes. And this gets back to some basic biological questions. Um, what limits the distance of communication? Um, really, it's probably not the rate of emission or the male having a lower threshold of response. It's in fact, the meteorological conditions that he encounters. Now there's a little bit uh, more information here on fine scale structure. Um, here we have a system where we use uh, negatively charged ions and we measure their concentration downstream. And in a forested situation, what we find is that uh, because the wind doesn't change direction all that fast, um, we may have situations uh, where the panel, uh, you, show, you see here, this probably would be fairly easy uh, for a male moth to follow uh, that sort of a plume, whereas in other cases there are these substantial many second gaps, again making it difficult for the insect to follow the plume. But this is the sort of <coughs> signal that is encountered fairly close to the source, and that's very important in orientation. This has been worked out by Tom Baker's group with heliothine moths, and we've worked it out with physotine moths. And what you see is if you allow a moth to cast because you've, in the wind tunnel, you've taken the pheromone source away, then you reintroduce it as a single puff of odor. 200 milliseconds later, 
um, the uh, mothing responds to that puff and it moves straight up one, but it never encounters another puff, so it gets back to casting. You string these together and you get nice upwind movement. Well, let's talk about the, the model here and we'll give you just one example of its output that's important to understanding the surveillance programs that we might use. Uh, we have to have rates of release in the model. We have to have a daily rhythm. We have to have a model of plume dispersal that deals with concentration of falling as you get farther from a source, that deals with wind direction. We have to have ranging strategies, which inevitably involve some sort of turning. They don't fly in a straight line forever. Um, and then there are upward maneuvers along the plume, which we've talked about. And we've talked about uh, uh, not casting, but the possibility now we can use sensitivity testing. We can match tracks to actual uh, virtual tracks to actual tracks and maybe understand something about the biology. The model itself uh, is pretty complex, but it just is a series of boxes that move the animal through the various stages that I've talked about. And uh, eventually, either the moth doesn't find the source or does find the source. A lot of it depends on the ranging behavior. So now I'm just going to talk about the significance of this in simulations that we've run. And what one finds is that, first of all, that trap efficiency is really important. So the red assumes that the trap is 100% efficient, and uh, the others assume very lower, level, lower levels of efficiency, perhaps 25%. It turns out that the traps used for gypsy moth are actually quite efficient, but for many other species, they may only be 5 or 10%. So that's a real problem for surveillance programs. What you see here is that if the you look at the upper left-hand panel, this is a very typical survey situation for gypsy moth. It's actually one that uh, is very difficult to achieve on trap per square mile. Uh, and you can see that if the population, for example, is 20 in that vicinity, that the probability of detecting that, even if the trap is 100% efficient, is only about 0.5. What this tells us is that uh, a lot of these uh, surveillance programs are probably missing low-level populations. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that uh, obviously is a concern to those survey people. If you have a lot of traps, as you have, for example, in the bottom panels, your chances of missing a population are, are pretty low. Uh, some of these uh, simulations on the bottom match the data that are available in the APHIS system. But when you get to very low densities, as you have in the upper left-hand left corner, there is, in fact, no way to actually uh, run those experiments. So these simulations can be very valuable at understanding the limitations of trapping surveys. So what I'd like to leave you with is, is the idea that uh, surveillance trapping uh, is, is a very, very uh, difficult process when you have very, very low populations. That trapping efficiency is extremely important. Uh, and it's not very much looked at, and that uh, even with a highly effective trap and a moth that seems to have a fairly long distance of communication and a fairly long uh, possibility of a good possibility of being captured in one of these traps at maybe 30 or 40 meters, uh, that we are probably going to miss populations. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ring, for, for this talk. Um, so our last speaker today, uh, you've seen him already. It's Jeremy Ellison. Uh, so Jeremy is a research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. Um, Quentin, you can uh, start playing his talk. Thank you. Good morning. It's my pleasure to talk with you today about mechanisms of differential trap performance for forest coleoptera, in particular the family Cerambicidae. My title is a reference to a paper by Phillips and Wyde in the early 1990s, in which they advocated an approach of direct observation of animals interacting with traps to determine ultimately why one trap might work better than another. I don't have to tell this audience that surveillance of forest insects is an important forest management activity 
and that it, it's a, a component of a variety of uh, management activities, um, some of which are listed here. Additionally, this audience would be familiar with the idea that attractant baited intercept traps are one of the most cost effective ways to detect or survey low density populations of target insects. Perhaps a bit hyperbolic, <clears throat> but the point I'd make here is that there's an elephant in the room with respect to the trapping literature. And that, that elephant is that these traps vary in the capture efficiency among taxa and that the capture efficiency is virtually unknown and often low. This is significant for a couple of reasons, one of which is that a priori makes it difficult to develop um, optimal sampling tactics for target taxa, and that this uncertainty can introduce uh, a lack of or re redu reduced reduction sorry, in sensitivity of operational programs, many of which rely on high sensitivity to be effective. <clears throat> if we think about studies that compare the performance of different intercept trap designs or intercept traps with different trap features, we can begin to compartmentalize or think about the, any differences that we might see as occurring at different levels in the orientation process. Some of those differences might be due to differences that occur in flight. So here this, this graphic shows a moth orienting upwind in response to an odorant emanating downwind from a trap. And so we could imagine that either or both the active space of the trap, the area downwind in which the, the odorant is in high enough concentration to induce upwind orientation, or the plume structure itself of those plumes emanating from different traps might differ and that could contribute to differences in trap capture. The next level shown in the middle uh, picture here would be the interaction with the trap itself. So the insects may differ in how they interact with different trap designs and that may translate into differences in the number of individuals captured. And the final stage would be retention. So once captured, what's the proportion of insects captured that are retained by the different trap designs? A variety of factors have been examined in the literature um, by uh, multiple groups, including mine. And here are some of the factors that have been looked at. And so if we begin to think about those stages, we ask ourselves what might be significant about that. And so it is not difficult to imagine that the trap design that might work best for uh, at one stage, sorry, might differ from that design which works best for one of the other stages. And so if we begin to be understand that, we can build um, the optimal trap. So if we look at these factors, <clears throat> we think about trap type. While it's not clear at what stage in the orientation process the differences are, are occurring, it's fairly clear that in this case it's not retention. Because although these three traps shown here differed in an experiment, we did in the number of cerambicids that they captured, the retention mechanism or collection vessel is identical among traps. So it, it suggests that it's either, either or both how they interact with the trap and their in-flight behaviors. When we look at um, experiments that compare traps with different surface treatments, here we've got multiple funnel and panel traps that are treated with different lubricants or not. <clears throat> Here it's fairly clear that differences that are observed, and there are highly significant differences with lubricant-treated traps catching far more <coughs> cerambicids, sorry, than untreated traps. <coughs> In this case, it's clear that it's the how the organism is interacting with the trap that where the effect is occurring. The three pictures shown in the bottom right are different types of collection cups dry cups, wet cups, or dry cup treated with fluon. And while we see effects here, the significant uh, take home is that wet cups do a much better job of retaining a higher proportion of captured beetles than do dry cups. And finally, the, the bottom left shows uh, where, <clears throat> again, it's the interaction of the organism or the beetle with the trap surface. And here we've got a large collection collar that catches beetles that strike the main column and fall outside of it. Um, when that collar, that collar, sorry, is treated with a lubricant, 
we see a significant increase in capture of beetles, suggesting that some beetles are falling outside of the trap column and that when there is a lubricant treated collar that catches those beetles, we, we observe an increase in trap catch. So a combination of mechanisms at play here. And if we combine all of those features and build what's called here the optimal design, <coughs> we see that we can have a significant increase in the performance of the intercept trap. So we are comparing here the optimal design that integrates the best feature of those four factors that I showed in the previous slide and comparing it to an off-the-shelf multiple funnel and panel trap. And so for the two subfamilies of Cerambicidae, Lamiinae, and Cerambicinae, we see about a five to tenfold increase in the number of beetles captured. <coughs> I also previously indicated that these traps differ in the community or sorry in the performance for different elements of the community of, of insects present in the in, in forest stands <clears throat> and that's what this figure here is showing so for those same experiments that looked at those different factors on the target abundance um, serambicidae we looked at all of the coleoptera we could identify in those traps and then analyze the data, and this is a collaboration with Chris McQuarrie shown in the, in the insert photo here, that the traps are actually sampling different elements of the community. So here the red is the multiple funnel, the, the blue is the panel, and the, the green is the optimal design. And I won't belabor the point much here other than to say the, the, the three different trap designs are sampling different elements of the community. <coughs> So at this point, I'll shift gears and say that, you know, as Phillips and Wyatt suggested, we need to begin to move past describing pattern and begin to understand mechanism. And so as they advocated, our first step was to observe trap approaches of monocamus beetles to odorant baited panel and intercept traps. And the bioassay is quite simple. This work is a part of the, the PhD work of Joel Goodwin, Goodwin, shown here, a PhD student in that I'm working with. And in clear cuts in northern Ontario, we positioned three observers uh, at 100 degree and 20 degree intervals outside of a five meter radius around an odor and baited trap. The three individuals would then observe the approach of beetles to the trap and score them as coming within five meters, three meters, one meter, contacting the trap and then being captured by the trap. And I would, the point I would make here is that um, all three observers had to score the trap um, approach identically. And they also scored the direction from which relative to when the beetles oriented towards the trap. So here's all of the observations. Um, binned by whether or not the beetles approached crosswind downwind or upwind to the trap and when we analyze the data to look for a, a deviation from random so uh, if, if it's random orientation to the trap we'd expect approximately 50 percent to come from crosswind since there are two different ways that you can go crosswind 25 percent from downwind and 25 percent from upwind and what we see is a significant departure with significantly more beetles approaching upwind to the traps than any other direction for both the multiple funnel and panel trap. <clears throat> and then if we further look at just those beetles that approach from upwind and, and plot them then for um, their approach, what we see is that approximately similar numbers of beetles, 108 and 105, came within five meters of the multiple funnel and the panel traps respectively. And there's two deliverable or two take home messages, I would say here. The first is that um, the, neither trap is doing a fantastic job of catching the proportion of the population approaching those traps that we would like. About 40% of those that come within five meters flying upwind to a panel trap end up being captured. Approximately half that, about 17% that fly upwind towards a funnel trap and come within five meters end up being captured. The second point I'd make here, so uh, the little table insert or some uh, analyses that Joel has done. And 
the take home here is that you know we really don't see any differences from hit to capture between the two trap designs or from five meters to three meters but from three meters into contacting the trap we see some significant differences in the performance of the of the multiple funnel and panel traps or differences sorry in the performance of the multiple funnel and panel traps so for me that this is suggesting that somewhere in that near field from three meters in the difference in performance of these two trap designs is beginning to express itself <clears throat> so here um, if we stop and we think about mechanism I, I really like this study by Wyatt et al. published in 1997 for its elegant simplicity. And here they're looking at the time it takes male anobium punctatum to orient to a point source of pheromone in a wind tunnel. And they have a simple two by two, so they've got visual barrier or sorry, visual stimulus present or absent, and an upwind barrier present or absent. And this this design is ex examining in very nice a simple way the fact that the, the trap has largely two effects so it presents a visual stimulus but it also has a physical effect on the odor plume as it moves downwind from the trap <clears throat> and then what we see is that if you look at the far left bar that yes there's a significant significantly less time to orient and land when both the visual and the upwind barrier are present that there is an effect of just the visual barrier that, that the beetles do are able to orient faster when there is a visual barrier present but the upwind barrier is absent but if we look at the the scenario sorry where just the upwind barrier is present it takes beetles approximately the same amount of time as when both the visual and the upwind barrier are present and the authors of this study con concluded that this suggested that it wasn't necessarily that this the visual stimulus associated with the silhouette per se but perhaps it was the effect of that silhouette on plume structure and i couldn't agree more so our first step then was to look to see if these beetles were in fact day active although not um, uh, necessary entirely it, it seems more likely that visual stimuli would be important for day active species and what we see for our target taxa here these three monocama species is that they are in fact day active so they're flying during the day suggesting that this may be a viable mechanism the visual the silhouette differences may present vi different visual stimuli that influence behavior and our experiment was quite simple here we have um, a black panel a white panel and then a custom made uh, clear panel in this case though that the trap is dirty um, and so it's less clear than it was at the beginning of the experiment and if we begin to look at the so the experiment was replicated sorry um, uh, in an open canopy so clear cut and then in the adjacent closed canopy stand that was left after the clear cut and we looked at uh, the number of monocamus captured in odorant baited traps and what we see is that yes the panel is performing better than the multiple funnel the top and the bottom bars but that there is seems to be an effect of the visual stimulus silhouette sorry presented that black panels do better than clear and white panels and that effect is is largely unaffected by the light levels so uh, high light in the open canopy low light in the closed canopy if we look at bark beetles we see a different pattern now in this case the multiple funnel trap is outperforming the panel trap in the open canopy but there's no effect of this the different silhouette present presented sorry in the the panel traps in the open canopy and in the closed canopy we see no effect of trap type on trap capture and so the third data here i'll show is we take a look at the the predators the the clarids we see no effect in the closed canopy largely because the beetles are all out in the clear cut but here we see no difference between the two black traps the multiple funnel and the panel trap so no evidence that the that perhaps the plume structure differs and is influencing behavior but what we do see is is clear effects of the silhouette so the black traps are outperforming the clear and the white traps now what about plume structure if we um, 
quickly run through an experiment that a postdoc working in the group, Mark Boer, shown here, did. He used carbon dioxide as a surrogate for pheromone um, and a sensor that was able to measure the, the carbon dioxide. And he was able to show differences in the accumulation of CO2 in a cuboid five meters by three meters by two meters downwind of different trap designs. And so we had multiple funnel panel and um, a modified multiple funnel and then a, a malaise trap. And then the top is just the um, CO2 released with no trap at all. And while we did observe differences, uh, the, the one point I'll make here is that limitations in the performance of the CO2 sensor really limited the analyses we were able to do here. And that the, the differences we did observe were not consistent with differences in trap capture in a field, sub, uh, a complementary field experiment that were done. So some evidence for silhouette differences, but not silhouette differences that can explain differences we observe in performance. So summarize all of this. Clearly, there are lots of different um, studies that have shown effects of different trap designs and trap features. These effects are uh, evident at both the abundance of target taxa and community sampled. And the, the real take home that I would emphasize is that we're at a point now where we really need to move beyond describing pattern and begin to examine mechanism in order to really have a chance at optimizing the performance of our surveillance programs. And we, and this, this work here at, um, illustrates that there's some evidence for both um, the plume structure and visual stimuli differing among the different trap designs. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And thanks again to Ring for the two presentations. Uh, so I think now we can open the discussion period. Uh, so I first have a um, question for both speakers, actually, for Jeremy and Ring. Um, I have heard that bark beetles, or perhaps any small insects drop to the ground when the wind exceeds certain speed because they cannot follow scents in turbulent air. Is that true? Jeremy, are you going to answer? Um, so I have to be honest, I've never heard that before. So Ring, have you? Well, there, there's some work dating back to even Shorey in the mid-60s where you exceed a certain wind speed and, and they, they don't seem willing to, to fly upwind and I, you know, it's five or 10 miles an hour, a metric equivalent. So yeah, I think very high wind speeds do cause them to sort of hunker down and, and not move upwind. Um, I'm less certain about beetles because I'm not a, a beetle expert. I defer on that one. Thank you, Rin. Um, yes, so have, oh, sorry. Yes, Maria. Thank you, Kevin. Certainly, uh, what was at wind speed, the scolitis and small insects will not take off. It's the barrier line effect. Still, for scolitis, the wind direction is crucial. If you dispose a large number of traps, say in a circle, you will see the upwind captures will be will vary from zero to very large number numbers in your traps placed in this circle. So. That's, um, I mean, common knowledge. Thank you, Maria. Um, I have a question for Rin. Um, how do multiple, multiple point sources influence plume following success? When do additional plumes begin to result to decreased success? Well, I guess there are two ways to think of that. Um, one of which is in a survey situation where you would probably not have traps close by each other because that's just not a very efficient way of doing it. So presumably you don't want them to interact. Oh, we have used uh, circles of traps with spacings at various distances to get an idea of when traps interfere with each other. So that's a sort of an alternative tactic to understand the possible range of attraction of a trap. But it also is difficult because it doesn't take into account ranging behavior. Uh, when females are calling and in very large densities, gypsy moths sometimes reach the astounding density of uh, 10,000 per, uh, you know, just square kilometer, and and they almost all emerge within a very short period of time. So it's it's not uncommon in a, a breakout situation to see multiple females simultaneously calling from tree trunks. 
And I think what happens then, um, we've documented some of this with gypsy moth anyways, is they have an alternative uh, mate finding tactic. Uh, males in those situations are encountering a lot of pheromone throughout the environment. And they seem to go back and forth up and down the trees uh, looking maybe for a higher concentration of pheromone uh, to locate the female. Oddly enough, uh, our work suggests that even though the female looks quite different on a dark tree trunk, that that uh, visual cue is not very important for uh, gypsy moth male orientation to the female. So, yeah, there are very few cases, I think, where you, you get these high density populations, but gypsy moth is certainly one of them. I now have a question for Jeremy. In the comparison among the several tribe comp components, do you see any pattern showing differences between day and night fly flyers? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so far, we've only been looking at day active species. So I, oh, that's not true. We've, we've done a little bit of work with budworm, um, but not to the level where we have a good feel for active space yet for that species. Um, so I, I, you know, it's hard to say that that's due to the day active versus night active, but you know, there aren't many species where we've got estimates of what the active space are. So it's difficult yet to begin to try to extract any pattern there, but um, hopefully in a few years, we'll have some more data on, on species that are both day and night active. Thank you. Uh, so another question for Ring that is kind of related. Does active space differ in day active and night active species? Well, Harold, Harold uh, Sissel actually touched on that a bit. And uh, as Jeremy just noted, we don't have a lot of good data for any species. We gypsy moth, we have great data. Um, there are a couple of uh, species that are day active. Uh, Wendell Roloffs and colleagues did a, a great study uh, many years ago with oriental fruit moth. And it looks like you're talking about maybe 20 meters in a very uh, unrestricted open field environment. Uh, that's uh, uh, species is active uh, in late afternoon. Um, codling moth is uh, basically night active. And I think the what evidence they've been able to extract suggests it's, it's far less than, than 20 meters. One of the things that uh, Harold pointed out, of course, was differences in the ways that plumes might be uh, shredded in different kinds of places, but you also have different kinds of uh, uh, optical environments. You can imagine if you uh, are living north of uh, Sweden, maybe in Finland, there's plenty of light throughout summer. There's plenty of light to sit down maybe and read a newspaper. So the optomotor response is clearly going to be much easier to deal with in Finland in summertime than it is going to be in Costa Rica in a rainforest in midnight where there's essentially very, very little light. So uh, that again, one of these uh, areas that uh, we understand that the theory suggests there should be differences in how capable they are because of the differences in foliage, differences in light level, but data are, are yet to accumulate. Thank you. Um, I have another question for Ring. Is your, in your experience, what's the maximum distance a pheromone dispenser can attract a moth? <laughs> well, uh, I think I'm going to rely on, on uh, gypsy moth, and, and I'm going to say it's in the range of a, a couple of hundred meters. If you look at the old literature, uh, they're claiming miles. Of course, we're in the, not in a metric world in the United States, uh, developing country, I guess, still. Uh, and <clears throat> they, they claim that you know, they're very, very long distances. If you actually look at those data, you find that the number of males caught is a fraction of those released. Some of the cages had 50 females in them. Um, and again, early experiments by Rao and Rao in, in St. Louis in the 1920s, 1930s, where they released silkworm moths. Again, they were talking about insects coming in over many kilometers, but then if you look at the data very carefully, you realize that they took sometimes a day, to, a day or two to do that, so you really don't know how much of that was ranging behavior. I, I just think that uh, we ought to imagine that the distance is in the range of, in case of a very good navigator, very sensitive male, uh, perhaps some males are coming in over uh, 100, 200 meters 
but for a lot of Lepidoptera, it's it's way way less than that, particularly if they're in foliage, uh, in in an environment like a vineyard or an orchard. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Jeremy. Considering the best design and retention traps combined with specific pheromones for forest cerambicids, do you think it will be possible to capture more than 30 to 40 percent of flying insects? If so, how much would you expect to reach? Yeah, so a good question. Um, I, I should have made the point in, in my talk there that, you know, those were percentages of approaches. So, you know, we, we the monocamus are big enough that you can see them in flight, but we, we don't know if an individual wasn't a, a captured, left the field of view, if they're reapproaching the same traffic trap again. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're not catching a higher percentage of, of beetles that are available. Um, the other thing I would point out is in that experiment, those traps were not lubricant treated. So they were off the shelf standard traps. So it, it's possible that of the design factors that are available to us that increase capture that that the proportion captured would be much higher if we repeat this experiment and observe the the interactions with the trap. So my my gut tells me that that we can do a much better job by just you know combining those those factors and that probably a much higher proportion are being captured. That proportion that we reported there is for the the poor performing off the shelf versions of the trap. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I have another question for Ring. Is there any evidence that within calling period that female moths modulate their calling activity in response to climate conditions? For example, changes in wind velo velocity. There, there seem to be, <clears throat> with moths at least, two kinds of uh, two kinds of moths. Some that pretty much once they start calling, they call continuously uh, throughout their calling period. Now, whether they're uh, modulating the amount of material emitted uh, is a little, it's very, very hard to measure. And, and Stephen Foster has worked on this more recently with uh, the uh, tobacco budworm moth, Ferrisons, and, and he has some interesting data that have just been published on, on changes in uh, rates of release based on biosynthesis. But there's no real indication that those moths are really uh, making an attempt to do that. On the other hand, it's been known for a long time that other moths go through what we call calling bouts. So they might call for five or seven minutes and then they might stop and then they might start up again. And so the question arises, are they conserving pheromone to uh, sort of uh, try and, and find a moth that would be in, a male moth that would be in the area and nothing happens in five to seven minutes they stop. One of the problems always with uh, lab bioassays is you really don't know what would happen if you'd sort of had that animal freely available to, to leave the confines of the lab. So it's also been proposed that maybe they call for five or seven minutes and in the field they take off and go someplace else and start calling again. So again, uh, two kinds of strategies, uh, but it's so hard to measure the amount of pheromone that is emitted for almost all of these species uh, on sort of a very, very accurate basis without a lot of a lot of lab setups that uh, we just really don't. I can't answer the question, but I can sort of suggest there are different possibilities. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for both Jeremy and Ring. Uh, either of you can answer. What factors do we need to think about when using trap catches to estimate relative abundance of a pest insect rather than just for detection? Jeremy, go ahead. <laughs> so that's a tough question. Um, you know, so that's sort of the the promise of, in part, chemical ecology over the years has been, you know, can we make the jump from surveyed or presence absence to um, predicting the future? And yeah, I mean, I wish we had better. I had more that I could point to to say, you know, I, I feel like understanding the proportion of individuals captured of those attracted is probably important that, that, that we can make better jobs of predicting if we understand that. I also think that 
understanding the spatial scale that these phenomena are occurring at is probably relevant here as well. That if you're estimating population, you know, defoliation or you know tree mortality on one spatial scale, but that our ability to sample the insects is happening at a different spatial scale, appreciating those differences probably is relevant. Um, I'm not sure I've done a great job of answering your questions and maybe Ring, you have something else to add or to correct? Well, well, not much to add. Uh, you know, clearly there are different kinds of traps. So if you're using a survey trap, such as a delta trap, it gets paved with insects fairly quickly. Uh, if you have any kind of a reasonable population. So that's only relevant for a survey trap that is for surveillance, I should say. Um, they also have something called a milk cart trap, which has a capacity of several thousand moths. But I know Joe Elkington, my colleague at UMass, has uh, shown that that really doesn't terribly well correlate with population density either. But in that case, uh, you know you're in trouble with gypsy moth because you can see the egg masses every place and uh, you know what's coming. So. I, I think it's harder to match density to trap catch uh, than you would imagine it would be because of uh, it's just not a smooth correlation. Uh, but it is sometimes useful in pest management situations where, for example, with cobbling moths, uh, there are protocols of a certain number of males over a certain time period suggest that you, you have a problem and you might want to consider an insecticide spray or remedial spray. So there are those specialized situations where it is helpful. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Jeremy. In your experience, have the suggested changes and improvements to traps been implemented commercially? Sometimes the recent discoveries are not applied and users keep using the same trap models. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that um, you can buy off the, like, lubricant treated traps um so i mean that i think that's a big improvement for some of these um particularly the larger wood borers i think that um there are a few companies i think um, synergy is one of them that sell um uh, intercept traps that have that large collar that can go on the bottom our experience is that that collar only works though if if it's lubricant treated so if that collar is is added but not lubricant treated i'm not sure there's much of a payoff there. So, so to some level, yes, um, Cam, it, it seems that that is that some companies now are are selling traps that reflect that. Thank you. Uh, so, another question for you, Jeremy. Have interactions been investigated with regards to mated or unmated individuals, or age of individuals, or possibly infection with nematodes? Um, okay, so I, I'm not sure, sorry, can you re repeat that and I'll look for it in the box just to see. Have interactions between, sorry, have interactions been investigated with regards to mated or unmated individuals or age of individuals or possibly infection with nematodes? So I assume the interactions means um, like on active space or, or trap capture, I, I'm not sure. Um, that I, I can answer. I'm not, I, I would be guessing what the question is, let alone the answer. So the question is from Jess, if she wants to okay. switch on her mic. Yeah, so when I asked that originally, you were talking about the interactions with trap catcher, uh, catchers. So that's what I was wondering about a few minutes ago when you were talking about, um, about interactions between the individuals in the act that you are actually collecting in the traps. Oh, so how individuals that are mated or unmated, for example, might interact with the trap or um, parasitize Right. Them. Yeah, or infected was another one that I was wondering about. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure they have. Um, certainly in my group, we focused pretty much on responses to pheromone baited traps. So, you know, it, it becomes a question of rare events so it would be really nice to to look at this in response you know for example in you know primary attractants or something but because the the number of beetles then that you might expect to to be attracted to the trap would be quite low per unit time um we haven't 
tried to do that yet. So in this case, you know, I'm asking people to, it, it's about an hour you can watch a trap and still reasonably expect to see what's happening around it. So in there, we, you know, we might expect to get 10 to 20 observations if we're out at the peak time of flight at a, on a good day. If you're doing that, you know, to, to um, just host volatiles, for example, where you might expect mated individuals to be orienting, you know, the, the payoff is going to be much lower. So we haven't begun to try to look at that, but it would be interesting to know. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so there is another question for Ring. A long ranging flight random direction, a few attractant sources would mostly be moving downwind. We discuss much upwind behaviors getting to the trap for the timing and dispersal of the insect in the landscape for a few sources is not a very large proportion of flight going downwind, sampling range over attraction range. Right. Well, of course, if you're in, in, in a fluid medium and moving about, and that fluid medium is, in fact, moving downwind, you, you are going to be eventually transported downwind with that. And I think there are certainly experiments that have been done in Sweden uh, that have looked at this and uh, suggested that there is some downward movement. Um, there might be some from New Zealand as well. The question arises whether this is really uh, a strategy of the animal trying to move downwind or it's just being transported. One of the things that a lot of these models don't take into account is that if you want to move downwind or upwind or some direction preferentially, you have to have some absolute sense of direction and what you've sensed over the previous half hour, 10 minutes, hour, in order to determine what that is. So, um, you know, I think that's a, a processing problem for insects to sort of keep track of that, uh, but sort of a passive movement as the wind might be carried. If it's a fairly a strong breeze, um, fetch is, is fairly strong, then in fact, even though you might be moving uh, up from an optimotor viewpoint, you don't pay any attention to how you're being transported because you're not trying to go up a plume, you are going to be carried with the wind. So that is, a, that is something to consider, correct. Thank you. Uh, I don't think there is more questions, but there was a comment from Juan Corley earlier in the comment, in the chat box. Uh, that's for Ring, and he said that leaf-cutting ants have been recently shown to respond collectively to windy conditions they experience in new range. They send out larger ants to mark trails. You have well, comments on that, Ring? Well, uh, I, I guess there must be a lot of uh, wind uh, at the uh, where the trail is, and I, it's a very interesting observation. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Jeremy, do you would you like to close the meeting or? No, just to, to say thanks, everybody, and um, we'll see you in two weeks' time. Cheers. Bye bye.